Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 25th, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate that. I am humbled by your appearance. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, let's keep talking about the current market conditions as we normally do. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. For your benefit, hold off on the stock picks until we get to the live charts. And I should be able to get through everything today fairly quickly. So we should have plenty of time for that. Also, if you don't mind, and again, for your benefit, just ask about one stock at a time and hit return. I'm going to continue my talk on following a methodology as the hardest, easiest thing you'll do. And we're basically taking the portfolio from back in February when it was the open portfolio that it is, was when it was on the cusp of going negative, and just following it forward to see what happened. And so far, so good. Knock on wood. Now, what are we going to talk about as far as focus? Let's talk about, or I'm going to talk about, I should say, the nuances of volatility. I want to have some closing thoughts on that, or at least a recap on that, and a couple of random thoughts about volatility. We had a little volatility type of setup last week, or anomaly in the markets, which was pretty cool. And then that also yielded a textbook TKO, and I used the example of the Qs last week, so I want to follow up on that. And then I got an email about VIX derivatives, easy for me to say, and that got me to thinking, should we trade or not derivatives of derivatives of derivatives? And that's going to make a little bit more sense, but not a lot more sense in a few minutes. Of course, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you could lose money trading, or as I'll have to sum it up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that line from my buddy Greg Morris. All right. As I said a second ago, we've been following up on the portfolio since February. Back then, the live portfolio, at least, was on the cusp of going negative. And my point is, well, just keep following along. And it's hard sometimes to give up some of those open profits. But it's what you have to do. And you'll be tempted to get out of those open profits, especially when... You have a situation where the portfolio is beginning to go negative and everything's beginning to turn a little sour. You're, you're going to think, well, you know, I better mitigate the damages. I better just quit. Well, usually that's the worst thing to do. The worst thing to do is just not follow your system. The best thing you do is just follow your system. So anyway, we were down to a very tiny open profit. In fact, if it wasn't for a closed swing trade, which we keep in the portfolio just to keep things simple, the portfolio would have actually gone negative. Now, again, this is the live portfolio except for this one trade that's still open. It's KEM. My point is just to walk forward through this to show you how not all the time, but usually following a plan is the thing to do. The problem with micromanagement, as I often preach, is it'll often take you out of perfectly good trades. And it's tempting to micromanage in your own life, in your business life, in your family life, controlling the situation and avoiding pain, stopping the bleeding, etc. is usually the thing to do. But in trading, you will have to take some risk. So I just want to continue to follow up with this. Unfortunately, we just have one winner left. Everything else has stopped out. But you know what? Maybe that'll be enough. And maybe that's a lesson in and of itself. As Sakota says, as you saw in the prior slide, one big winner pays for them all. And so far, that's the lesson in this. So we get to say bye, Felicia, for one more week. Now, I kind of just zipped through this. Uh, I've been talking about this for the last, oh, how many weeks? How many weeks is that? Uh, six, seven, eight weeks or so. So go back and watch prior shows if you want to know more about that. Eight, well, maybe ten weeks. Anyway, I want to give a little re recap on the nuances of volatility. And volatility is a fairly complex subject. We could spend, obviously, hours talking about it, but I just want to kind of hit the highlights on a couple things. Remember that volatility tends to cycle between high and low, and as I said, highs and lows. And as I said last week, uh, Larry Connors did a lot of volatility research. A lot of his stuff came from uh, Natenberg. I think it's Sheldon Natenberg. I, I'm trying to see if I have the, his book handy in my... Um, in my bookcase. But anyway, so Larry kind of took the ball and ran with it with his research. 
and did a lot of research. And Larry once said that volatility is more cyclical than price. So that kind of left me on, or led me on, I should say, a bit of a volatility type of journal. I really got into volatility for a while. I never did leave, leave momentum, but I just thought volatility was a really cool thing. And I did some VIX stuff too, and we'll talk about that in just one second. What's cool about volatility is it tends to overshoot itself when it expands. So volatility dries up, and then all of a sudden it just absolutely takes off. Now this this can be used to our advantage, especially if you avoid the first move and then take the false move, or I should say you avoid the false first move and then take the opposite move, which will make sense in one second. And it, it's also an anomaly that occurs in these derivatives, these VIX derivatives, which we'll talk about in one second, which could get you into a lot of trouble. Now, as I just said, the first moves are often false moves from a low volatility situation. And years ago, I wrote a, uh, an article, I'm kind of dating myself, 1998, which was published in Stocks and Commodities. And it talked about a volatility trading goal that I took, I was way back in my CTA days, and what I was looking for was a low volatility situation and then look to play the fake out move in that particular case. Now, this is what happened in the NASDAQ composite. This is the 6-5 HV ratio, which is historical volatility. This is the 50-day HV, and then this is the 6-day HV divided by the 50-day HV, which gives you this ratio. And... I think Connors was the first to point out that when this drops to very low levels, specifically below half percent or so, I'm sorry, below 50% of its average range, you're due for a reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend. Now, what's kind of cool is the first move is often a false one. So you've got this big volatility expansion caused by this bar here. So the point I was trying to make last week was, Instead of trying to trade in the direction of that volatility move, why not fade the move? And in this particular case, we also had a TKO. Now, I'll show you the TKO in the Qs in one second, and that'll make more sense. Now, what I would encourage you to do is not to trade volatility in and of itself, unless, of course, you want to make that your life's work, your life's work. Um, because volatility can be quite complex, but if you can learn a little bit about volatility, you can use the nuances to your advantage. In the aforementioned example, the um, NASDAQ had a low volatility situation and a fake out lower, which was also a TKO within a trend. And as I preach quite often, everything works better with trend. I've seen some people use some arcane methods and absolutely print money. And they think, wow, I have discovered the Holy Grail. But no, they started trading doing a very, very trending market. And that trend persisted. And unfortunately, and I've seen it in more than one case, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus or pick on anyone. But unfortunately, I've seen quite a few people have this go to the head when they just start doing a great momentum cycle and they're following something that's very complex, but it just seems to fit perfectly with the market. And that's because they're trading in the direction of trend. Well, as soon as their methodology tells them to go against the trend or if the trend turns and it's still telling them to do the opposite, then that's when they tend to blow up or lose a lot of money. So the point I'm trying to make, long story endless, everything works better with, Kent, with trend. Okay, Donald says that Sheldon... Natenberg, yeah, that's him. Uh, option, volatility, and pricing, 1994. I believe Connors used H3 ratio of 6 and 100 and 10 and 100 in his work. Yeah, um, he's all. he did a lot of 652, and I did a lot of programming for Larry back in the 90s. Um, I have a degree in computer science, and I did a lot of easy language programming and system testing, both on my own. And I did some consulting work, and I did work a little bit with Larry. We did we did work with the 650 and the 6100. Um, the 6100 is going to be a less powerful, but uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be a more powerful but less frequent type of signal. So you certainly could use 6100 and 10100. Um, if I was heavily in the volatility, like I used to be, 
if memory serves, I had all three plotted on the charts, the 650, the 10100, and the 6100. Um, it's gonna, you're going to get more signals, again, with that longer-term volatility as opposed to the shorter-term volatility type of signals. Because if you think about it, what's 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 six divided by fifty? That's like uh, eight percent, twelve percent. Six divided by fifty is twelve percent, right? Six divided by fifty. Yeah. So your 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 observation window is twelve percent of the uh, of the volatility window. Plus, the longer term volatility is going to tend to be more normalized, so to speak. But yeah, let's not get too far into that right now but uh, good point on that Donald thanks for bringing that up uh, again so the point is learn the nuances of volatility so you incorporate it into your trading you don't have to know the statistics and all that other crazy stuff just like I could flip a switch and get electricity without knowing a whole lot about electricity same thing applies to volatility now last week I talked about the beauty of a textbook TKO type of setup. And by textbook, I mean that a situation where you get a nice wide range bar down in an obvious and ideally persistent trend. And when that happens, you'll get your entries defined, which defines, which, and you also get your stops defined, excuse me, you also get your stops defined, which thereby also gives you your initial profit target. Now let's take a look at that, and that'll make a little bit more sense. So notice in this particular case, we had a wide range bar down, a poor close. And in that particular case, you could get in nearly above the high and put a stop nearly below the low. The reason I use the word nearly is in a textbook fashion, yeah, right above the high, right below the low. But in reality, you probably want to give it a little bit of wiggle room above and a little bit of wiggle room below. And as we'll, I'll flesh it out in a lot more detail when we get to the um, NASDAQ setup. I'm sorry, the Q setup here. So obviously your entry minus your stop is your risk. And the way we trade this hybrid money management, we're looking for a swing trade on a one-to-one -one risk to reward. But Dave, doesn't it have a ne negative expectancy? Well, yeah, if that's all you've got. But the idea is to continue to follow along for as long as it moves in your favor. That's a have your cake and eat it too mentality that I often talk about. In other words, Trade for the short term because you can only predict the short term, but be willing to stick around longer term in case that longer term trend ensues. And that's where the money is. And that's the point I was making a few slides back by pointing out that, yeah, we only have that one big winner left in the portfolio going back to February, that is. But that might be all it takes to make it. One big winner, again, pays for them all. So anyway, if you take your risk one for one, that's your initial profit target. And then all you have to do, I know, easier said than done, is follow the plan. It's like my wife. She's always like, uh, you know, all you got to do to fix this leaky faucet is just tighten it up a little bit. You know, it's like, oh, geez, you know. And three hours later, I'm covered with water, and we got to shut the water off to the house, and I got to run to Home Depot for the third time. And one time she was helping me on projects. She went to a plumbing supply store, and she walked in, and she goes, I need three of everything that you have. <laughs> so... But on the surface, things look a lot easier than they really are. Once you're actually in the trade, it's a little harder to follow along. But a lot of times, and that's why I often say it's the hardest, easiest thing you ever do, or the easiest, hardest thing you ever want to do, however you want to look at it. But a lot of times, you don't have to do anything. So like in that prior portfolio, there was nothing to do but let the stops take you out and let the stops keep you in. But I know a lot of times it's easier said than done. So let's take a look at the Qs. Notice that we were in a pretty serious uptrend, and in more recent times, that uptrend began to accelerate. So an ideal setup, you want to have an uptrend that is not only accelerating, but also persistent, meaning that it tends to go up day after day after day. Now, as I often preach, mathematically, that's equivalent, easy for me to say, to linear regression, but I just prefer to draw a line through as many bars as possible. And notice that we had this longer term trend and then we saw some acceleration in more recent times. And then of course we had a nice little TKO move lower, giving you an entry above the high, a stop below the low, 
And again, this is a textbook type of setup. Now let's follow up on that textbook TKO situation. So again, we had a poor close, nice little knockout type of move, which would give you an entry above the high and ideally maybe a little bit of wiggle room in here and a stop below the low. And again, maybe give it a little bit of wiggle room. But let's just follow this mechanically or on a pure mechanical basis to show you how it works. Now, it doesn't always work, but in this particular case, so far, so good. So your risk would be your entry minus your stop, and we'll take a look at that in one second. And then you take that and slide it up, and that's going to give you your initial profit target. So let me show you the math on that. Now, if you were getting in at the high plus one cent, and I would again, I would give it a little bit of wiggle room, minus the low, minus one cent, that's going to give you 2.74 risk slash additional profit target. So that's what you're looking to make on the trade, 2.74 points. You add that to your entry, which would give you a target of 141.52. And at that level, you would take off half your profits. Now, before we go any further, I'm not suggesting that you rush out and trade indices, but every now and then you get a textbook set up like this. It's something like an index, and it's worth taking a shot. For the most part, indices and many other markets, such as Forex, tend to be very efficient and choppy and hard to trade, especially from a trade following perspective. However, every now and then, they set up nicely to make it worthwhile trading. So I wouldn't suggest you run out and trade E-minis every day. Let everybody else fight it out there. But if every now and then you get a really nice setup like this, it might be worth a shot. You're not going to get rich with this type of trading, but you might put a little food put a little food on the table. Is that what I'm trying to say? Um, I'm going to mix my metaphors here. And you make a little bit, okay? Better than poking the eye type of deal. All right, any questions on the TKO or anything else before we shift gears here? Okay. I received this email. It said, hey, Dave, do you have any experience or comments on trading XIV and VXX? Trade has been very good in XIV. It seems like it would be possible to ride the trend on one and set up counter trend buys when the other side spikes. Just curious about your thoughts as this is a vehicle. Well, it's, it's not what you know. It's what you better know when it comes to these derivative type of products. Now, as I was putting together the slides this morning, I'm like, geez, I really want to get into this talk about these derivatives when I'm really not an expert on them. I did do I did write some VIX systems way back in the aforementioned trading markets days and Connor's days and back then. And I actually put one or two of them in my uh, first book. But I'm not a huge fan of trading these things outright, but you could use them as a tool. If you see some kind of anomaly happen in the VIX, then you could use it in your stock trading. Also, I don't follow the VIX that closely. It only matters when it matters as far as I'm concerned. So if you see the market sell up hard, then I take a peek at the VIX to see what's going on there. But for the most part, I don't bother with it that much. Now, my point today is not to show you what I know, but rather that I do not know, okay? But I do know to steer clear. And that's going to make a little bit more sense in one second. So the point I hope to drive home is that you might not know either. They're a lot more complex than they seem on the surface. And the behavior is not always what you would expect them to be. Now, there's spikes and nuances, but there's even a fundamental problem with a lot of these derivatives of derivatives of derivatives, and I'll show you why that is in just one second. And even so-called experts can be wrong, and wrong big on these things. I'm friends with someone that knows more about options and VIX than anyone else in the world, and that's Larry McMillan. And I would never throw anybody under the bus, but sometimes it's happened in the past where Larry and I are having beers together, and we talk about markets and stuff and and the people we know and then he's pointed out that some of these people get on tv who should know better who've been at this for 20 30 40 years and they'll actually say things that are just flat out wrong about the vix so 
you really need to fully understand these things and realize that even some of these people that should know how they work can actually get it wrong. And the other thing you need to realize, too, is that if you're trading volatility, you're not necessarily trading technical analysis. Volatility has a complete different characteristic than price, okay? So, as I said a second ago, as I learned from Larry, volatility tends to be more cyclical than price. It tends to compress and expand, whereas price has other anomalies. Technical analysis, you're reading the psychology of the market, okay? And you're using technical analysis to help you do that, whereas volatility analysis is a completely different type of analysis. So it's not necessarily pure technical analysis, at least the way I like to, to use technical analysis. Now the VXX, which Paul was asking about, is a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, VIX is a derivative, okay? VIX is, what is VIX? It's the act of money hypothetical price. I mean, there's even hypotheticals in a derivative, right? It's the hypothetical act of money price of puts and calls. I think it used to be on OEX 500. And... There's a lot of ifs and there's a lot of hypotheticals, but it's always like 100 days out. So it's not like, or I'm sorry, how many days out is it? See, I've forgotten. I've already forgotten exactly what the VIX calculates. But it's puts and calls, and that's what confuses some people. They don't realize that. And it's the at the money implied volatility, but it's a hypothetical expiration that does not necessarily exist except in a computer model. Okay, now confused? Yeah, I am, I'm already confused myself. So just know that the VIX is a derivative based on option pricing of a hypothetical expiration model. Okay? And then VIX futures are a derivative of VIX. They have an expiration date. Okay? It's a price of something futures. 30 days out. Thank you, Dom. Okay? VIX is a hypothetical 30 day out at the money implied volatility of puts and calls. And I think I think that's pretty close. VIX futures is a derivative of a derivative. Okay, what's a derivative? Something that derives its value from something else. So the VIX is a derivative that derives its value from a hypothetical calculation. And then VIX futures derives its value from the VIX. So now we have a derivative of a derivative. The problem with the VIX is that futures that is is that there is a decay in futures. So let's say you're 30 days out in your futures, and then tomorrow you're what? You're 20 day, 29 days out in the future. So everything changes a little bit by one day, okay? And then that those changes just keep compounding as you go through it. So if you take the VXX, it's derived from VIX futures. So now we have a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. Did you get that? So it's a very complex trading vehicle. And most people do not understand it. And I don't pretend to fully understand it. I've listened to a few lectures in person with Larry McMillan at the American Association of Professional Technical Analyst Meetings. And he made my head spin a lot, but he taught me a lot of things that make a lot of sense. And one thing I learned from that is, I don't want to, to mess with them, okay? And when you have a derivative based on a derivative that decays, such as futures, in other words, contango, it will have a perpetual decay problem. So every day, every day the calculation changes. And then that creates this longer-term decay. Now, you first see this and say, well, I'm just going to short it. Well, you might be able to do that, and you might be able to do okay, but the problem is you're going to make a little, 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 make a little with that decay, and all of a sudden something in the world is going to happen, and you're going to have a huge spike, and you're going to erase a lot of those gains, okay? So I would encourage you not to do that, and here's where the complexity gets even worse. If you 
unadjusted for reverse splits. They have to they have to reverse split this thing every now and then because eventually it'll go to zero if they don't. So this is what the chart looks like unadjusted for reverse splits. The whole point I'm trying to make is it's a very complex thing and I would suggest you to steer clear of this and I'm getting a little further ahead of myself but unless you want to make this your life's work and even if you make it your life's work it's pretty amazing that people who should know better and again I don't want to throw anybody under the bus but people who should know better are saying things that are just flat out wrong and I only know they're wrong because I learned from Larry how it works and Larry explained to me why they got it wrong and the reason they get it wrong a lot of times is because the confusion about the futures price okay or the pricing based on futures I should say now and here's one thing you have to realize this is where it gets even worse if I had to convince you that they're complicated enough they could decide to change the rules on you and it has happened this is some of the things that Larry has talked about Larry McMillan has talked about in his speeches where they actually change the rules on the fly on some of these derivative of derivative of derivative type of, of uh, instruments. So that's kind of a crazy thing that can happen. And again, you could have these huge anomalies and things that happen. So if you still think you want to trade them, again, make it your life's work, okay? And then realize that they could change the rules on the fly on these things. There could be some kind of unknown nuances. There's a lot of moving parts. A lot of things can happen. And they could have a huge spike in between. So anything you make, you could end up giving up really quickly. And then maybe even then some. And I've been up close and personal with some derivative type of blow-ups. Okay, more than I care to admit maybe a two drink minimum we can uh, you'll get some stories out of me might even be a three drink minimum in some of these stories but just trust me on this I've seen some really bad things happen and I've seen really bad things happen to the people uh, involved okay present company included so let's just leave it at that now my way to uh, my way to wrap my head around this and I think what I'm trying to say is that if you can't trade trend, if you can't do something simple like just trading trend, I doubt seriously that you'll be able to trade volatility, okay? And also, just as a side note, keep in mind that things can work for a long, long time until they don't and kind of lull you into that false sense of security. For instance, selling options will work really well for quite a while, sometimes a very long time until it don't. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm holier than now. I personally have a hard enough time just trading the trend. So I'd stay away from them. Run, don't walk away. I just got an email back from Paul while I'm presenting. Paul says, I'll proceed with caution and test it over time with small positions. All right, that's, that's, uh, that's plausible. All right, any questions on any of this stuff so far? Okay, Donald. Yeah, when we get to the charts, I'll take a look at that for you, Donald. All right, it's here. <laughs> Finally, it's taken me about two years, but I am rolling it out. I think today I'm going to throw a switch on a couple things on the live, live version. But if you want to get started with this course right now, the first, I think, uh, base videos which are four videos are completely free and I've been getting a lot of great feedback so far from that so that's uh that's pretty cool and I'm going to incorporate that into some of the things that I'm doing both here and in the uh, and in the upcoming videos which are being rolled out now starting today uh, I'm really excited about this but you know obviously the the uh, the final arbiter will be will be you so Check out the first four videos, and let me give you the link to that. It's uh, www.davelander.com slash trade-docs-successfully. And the reason it's uh, full circle is because when I started it, it started out as a basics course, and then I realized that even though it's the basics, 
this is exactly what I use in my own trading. And this is these patterns, mostly things like the TKO, the patterns combined with the money management, combined with the psychological issues that you all face out there, present company included, is really what you need to know to get to become successful. And if you find yourself kind of venturing into VIX futures or or options or some derivatives and all these other things or some sort of arcane arcane methods and then you begin to lose your way, well, what do you need to do? Well, you need to come back to the basics. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, as you can see. But again, you guys will be the final arbiter and I welcome feedback. And this is going to be part of the, or it is part now, uh, today, maybe this afternoon when I flip the switch, but this will be part of the learning management system. So as I've said last few weeks or a few months or however long, I don't know, I get tired of hearing my own self speak too, but uh, a lot of times I'll have people that, are, that ask me questions and ask me questions and ask me questions and I answer them, answer them, answer them. And then I'll be like, geez, will you just go back and read this? It's, read this chapter. Just read this chapter, and it's all in there. And then they'll tell me, well, I'll be mean to get your book. So you'll lose money for 20 years in the market, but you won't follow somebody's methodology, but you, but you won't buy their book. doesn't have to be my book. doesn't have to be my methodology, but I would never try to follow someone without fully learning what they're doing and what they're attempting to do and make sure it works for me. With this learning management system, I could say, well, you didn't watch the video, so why are you asking me questions about that? Go back and watch the video. And guess what? Got to take a quiz when you finish it to make sure you got the information. And that's one thing that's been kind of cool is when I'm putting together these questions for these, these videos, which you're not going to see in the initial ones, but once you get into the learning management system, you will. This is actually not part of the learning management system, but then these are rolled into the whole course, which is but once you get in and start taking the quizzes, even in these really first basic videos, I was shocked at how much information, how much pertinent information is in there and how much stuff that you're just going to have to come back to whenever you get stressed out or from a psychological standpoint or whenever you lose your weight. And I don't want to go on too long. I don't care. I know <laughs> too late. But let's say you're having some psychological issues. Well, go in and just watch these first four videos. And I, I took a page out of, Tom McClellan's speech where he talks about how you're not only forming a relationship between you and the company when you buy a stock, but you're also forming a relationship between anyone else who has bought the stock prior to you, okay? And those people screw you. And if you think about your own actions, have you ever sold a stock because you needed money, okay? That has nothing to do with the underlying company. Have you ever sold, sold a stock because you were afraid the profit would evaporate? Well, that has nothing to do with the underlying company, all right? So realize that the actions of the others can screw up a perfectly good trade. As Mark Douglas said, all it takes is one eight hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. So again, that's all going to be part of the learning management system, which I flip the switch today, God willing. And then again, check out the free videos in the course. All right, let's hop into the charts. Donald wants a quick question. I'm going to go ahead and cover the overall market and some sector actions first. But if you guys want to start asking and girls about some individual stocks, feel free to start now. And then uh, let me just see what Donald is asking here. He says, uh, would you go through the recent TKO and PXLW as one that did not work? Okay, let's see. Well, this is one... Um, First of all, okay, what did I say earlier? You want to give it some wiggle room, okay? So, yeah, I mean, nothing's perfect, okay? What was that song, Not Even a Perfect Stranger? But if you gave it some wiggle room, then first of all, you might not have gotten triggered, okay? But, yeah, sometimes trades just flat out don't work, and it still looks pretty good. Even if you did get triggered and stopped out, it still looks pretty good. My only problem with this one, and this is why I didn't put it in my trading service, I think it's in, well, I can't show you, but it's in the Landry list, or has been for a while, as a mediocre setup, looking good shorter term to intermediate term, but longer term it's got some issues, and that's why we didn't go after it. So, yeah, it didn't work, even though it was nearly textbook in nature, but two things. One, 
you could have used a more liberal entry, and that would have stopped you from getting triggered in on noise alone. Or two, even if you did get triggered in, maybe a liberal stop, you'd still be in, or worst case, you get stopped out for a 2% loss. And guess what? It's still set up, so you can go after it again. Now, with the caveat that don't take the setup because I don't like what's going on back here. So hopefully that answers uh, your question. They don't always work. Sometimes a little wiggle room will help to keep you from getting into a bad trade. And if you even do get in a bad trade, the stop will take you out. Okay. You want to look at AXGN? Okay. Well, let's, uh, okay, AXGN, and then we'll take a look at the, uh, we'll take a look at the overall market and go from there. Yeah, now this TKO right here could have been a little bit bigger, and that's probably why I didn't go after it, if memory serves. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more knockout there. But, yeah, obviously it did work, okay? All right, let me go through the market real quick, and then we'll get to your um, your questions. Good. Uh, looks like some good stock picks are coming in. I recognize quite a few of those symbols. Good stuff. All right, let's take a look at the overall market real quick, and then let's drill down to some sectors, and then we'll take a look at your stocks. First of all, the P's, bam, winning. Now, if you're following along in the trading service and uh, the market in a minute, at least, over the last few days, one thing I had been concerned about is that, obviously, we had to sell off, and then we came back nicely, at least initially, and then we started drifting in here, okay? I don't like a market that drifts higher. I like to see some acceleration higher, and then, if anything, a drift lower. But knock on wood, so far so good. Nice little breakout today in the P's. I'd like to see even a little bit more acceleration, but so far so good. Um, you can't get too caught up in news. I don't want to digress too far into that because I've talked about it quite a bit. If you go to my website under videos, I think I have all the links there. Let me see if I can find it for you. But so far so good. We had this um, end of the world, what was that, a week or so ago? when there was some political news or whatever happening, and then the market just did a complete do-over. Sometimes the market just sells off. Don't try to connect the dots. You'll get into a lot of trouble. And one thing I often say is be careful with the news and avoid the news. And if you go to my website in the videos, you can find all the uh, weekend charts there. And let me just show you where that is real quick. Let me pull the NASDAQ while I'm talking. Okay, NASDAQ, just shy of all-time highs yesterday. Bam, winning at all-time highs today. So if you go here under videos and you go to this one here, which I guess was two weeks ago, which is another one of my classic Dave Landers, read my lips, ignore the news uh, deal. So check that out after the show for a lot more on ignoring the news. Also, in the third video, I think, of the uh, – Trading Full Circle series, which is free, that part of it at least. I talk a lot about the news, so make sure you watch that too. But so far, so good in NASDAQ, up a little bit more than a half percent, breaking out to all-time highs. When a market is at or near all-time highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. Stop me if you heard that before. Rusty, bit of a bummer, okay? Stuck in this stupid hot sideways range for so far all of 2017. Okay, we did peak back, peak out to new highs not that long ago, so all wasn't lost. But then we're kind of back where we were way back in December of 2016. Okay, we got a little bit of a rally today, but we're already off our best levels. So I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. I always hate to say cautiously optimistic because it's such a stupid thing to say. You know, because if it works, you're like, ah, I told you I was optimistic. And if it doesn't, you can say, ah, I told you I was cautious. <laughs> but I am cautiously optimistic, give it the benefit of the doubt. We're not that far away from all-time highs. But I sure would like to see this index get there and stay there and beyond. Okay? Now, all in great in the world. Some of these commodity-related areas, like the energies, are looking a little dubious or still looking dubious in here. They've been really choppy, but as a general statement, as you can see, they've worked their way lower. Metals and mining also a bit uh, questionable in here, as you can see. Uh, gold is just kind of all over the place. For me to get excited about gold, I'd almost like to see it go down, or I would like to see it go down and hit new lows, 
like we were in 2016 and then look to play it on the upside with transitional patterns. But right now it's wide and loose and all over the place. Let's take a look at gold to commodity while we're here. And gold to commodity is wide and loose and all over the place. So I wouldn't get too excited about um, that right now. <laughs> When I go in the house, sometimes I'll put on TV, you know, like the, these, the, if silver returns to just half of its all-time value, you make 60%. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, if my aunt had, she'd be my uncle, you know. <laughs> it's like, it's so stupid. Anyway, I digress. What's silver doing? Yeah, silver's all over the place too, okay. But yeah, if it returns to its all-time value, yeah, that'd be great. You know, yeah, so you'd make uh, 300%, okay. If, if we're a skiff, we'd all go for a ride, right? Now, the other thing I want to show you is some of the areas like these regional banks have been looking pretty dubious in here, too. As you can see, it looks like major tops remain in place there. I wouldn't say it's the end of the world, nor can you see it from here, but eh, just not looking so hot. Uh, let's throw a bow tie in there. Let's see what we got. Yeah, you could see that they did bow tie right off of these major highs in here and sometimes when you get that double top bow tie or what I call the second mouse bow tie the early bird gets the worm the second mouse gets the cheese it can be a very powerful signal so I think banks are dubious at best especially these regionals at this juncture also I've been looking at the um, brokers as an area that's been in trouble so selected financials are not doing so hot in here and you can see the brokers kind of just made this gradual long-term top, and then they begin to break down. We're currently short MS, and I'll show you why. Uh, notice this textbook type of bow tie, okay, off of all-time highs. Hasn't worked yet, though, okay? But what are we doing? Well, we've got a stop in place. Doesn't work, doesn't work, okay? It happens. Spelled with a silent SH, okay? But this sure looks like a market that's in a lot of trouble. So selected financials, still in trouble. One thing that's kind of interesting, take a look at the M&C stocks, material construction stocks. There was a lot of excitement about these stocks. Obviously, if you're going to build the wall, you're going to need some materials and some construction. Well, what I don't like is that they kind of had this little snap back up to these prior highs and didn't quite get there. Now they're stalling out a little bit. It's kind of reminiscent of a gatekeeper type of pattern. And we don't quite have a bow tie yet, but these moving averages are turning down and crossing over. So I wouldn't rush out and short this area just yet, but I would uh, certainly sit on my hands about going long on anything, on your stops on any existing positions. Remember, we don't bail out on existing positions when things get iffy because sometimes it could just be a correction in a longer-term trend, and maybe that's all we're seeing right now in these M&C stocks. Media not looking so hot. I guess all the fake news is catching up to them. Uh, you can see bow tie down all-time highs, or I think it's got to be all-time highs or nearly all-time highs. Let's see. Yeah, bow tie down off of all-time highs is usually a pretty good signal to pay attention to. Let's take a look at a weekly on this, just for S&Gs. Not quite, not quite a weekly down, but we had a weekly down way back here. And let's see, what's that? Didn't have a huge drop, but had a fairly significant drop out of that weekly bow tie. But definitely have a daily bow tie here. I think these stocks are definitely in trouble. Transports, we talked about last week. Uh, one of you guys was looking at the ETF. The ETF looks a lot worse than the transports that are in the media general groups. Is it still mean? Oh, it's Morningstar now. Morningstar groups of uh, Telechart. But today, so far so good, and we're not too far from all-time highs. So... Kind of hanging in there. Tried to roll over, tried to bow tie, but it, the bow tie never triggered FYI. And then looks like they're trying to go to brand new highs. One of my, my mother-in-law's friends, she got when she first got the internet, she was it's a, her job to warn the world. It's a, like she'd read something about you know some guy get, hiding underneath the car and slicing your Achilles ankle, and she felt compelled to tell everyone. So I was getting all her emails, and it was driving me nuts. So finally I just said, you know, check what Snopes FYI. She's like, FYI, what does that mean? So she thought I was, like, telling her F you. <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure what that has to do with trading. Um, but anyway, uh, not too far from these all-time highs. So let's give it the benefit of the doubt. I'm not a huge Dow theorist where I think the transports have to confirm what the overall market is doing, but it certainly doesn't hurt when they do. I'd much rather watch something like the semis 
to see if they're confirming what's going on. And so far, so good in the semis. They had that little bit of a drifting pattern in here, but they're just shy of these nearly all-time highs. I think this is like, uh, it was higher in 2000. Probably half those companies no longer exist. I know half the dot-coms don't longer exist. Probably 90% of the dot-coms are no longer existing. I had no coffee. That, well, I had coffee this morning, but not before the show. Anyway, most areas look okay, especially technology-related. There are a few uh, caveats in here, like some areas that are looking a little dubious that I pointed out, but most areas looking pretty good. Health services, banging on new highs. So for the most part, I think the market is okay. Now, I'm not seeing a whole lot of setups just yet. And the reason I'm not seeing setups is, like, take a look at health services. If it's banging out new highs, we're not going to see setups as pullback players. If the NASDAQ is banging out new highs, we're not going to see setups as pullback players. So that's why we're not seeing a tremendous amount of setups at this juncture. All right, RJ wants to talk about REGN. Come on, there it is. All right, I'm not seeing a setup. Um, one thing I am seeing here is it's kind of wide and loose. It does have some bad memories way over here. I think I would leave this one alone because of those bad memories. And here's the other thing that's kind of jumping out of me a little bit. Notice that it took off, and then now it's kind of in this drift mode. So I think I would pass based on that. I think you could find something much better especially when the NASDAQ itself is in a, in a persistent uptrend and accelerating. Joe wants to know about IMMU. Um, see, that's got that drift to it, too. It looks like it's off to the races, but most of, that, most of those gains are right here, and then it really hasn't gotten past its prior high. Let's back chart out a little bit. It looks okay. It's a little wide and loose. Um, Put it on your watch list. For me to get excited about this one, it would have to clear this prior peak decisively and then pull back and then also accelerate higher in the process. So a lot of ifs in that sentence. So I think you could probably find something better to put on your watch list. IBN for RJ. And let's see if we can find something else. Now, I'm not, not a big foreign regional banks right now or not doing so hot. Let's take a look at the sector. Part of that might because, be because Brazil imploded. But if anything, these foreign regionals look like the mother of all shorts in here. So if I have a sector that looks abysmal and then I find a setup within the sector, it really better knock my socks off. It, it, it has to be the best setup in setup town or would have to be the best setup in setup town for me to take it. This right here would not be because it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. You know, maybe if it begins to, to accelerate higher, and it's another one of those cases where most of your little jump was like right in this few bars here. So I think I would let this one go. I think there's probably something better and more trending that you can find out there. I have about 100 stocks in my momentum list that I'm watching right now, and I, and I guarantee you this is not going to be one of them, but... You should be able to find, again, with the NASDAQ, with the NASDAQ looking like this, you should be able to find some stocks that are trending a little bit better and not wide and loose and in a decent looking sector, okay? I don't want to be, I don't want to beat you up on that too much, but I want to make sure that um, I cover everything. SQ is going to be square. I like this one. Now, here's a stock that's a trending and accelerating. The only thing a little scary, a little overextended in here, but maybe on the mother of all knockout moves. Now, early on, it had a lot of problems, but it looks like it's gotten its act together. And then you got a nice little breakout, and now you're banging out brand new highs. If there's anything IPO to glean from this, not really. But, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Keep it on your list. Jill wants to talk about IRWD. Did we talk about that one? Yeah, it would have to it had to clear this prior peak decisively before I put that on my uh, watch list. Mule in a pullback, but price is over twenty. All right, let's take a look at that for Arsene. Yeah, this is a uh, this is what I would call the um, Dave Landry's five day 
IPO moving average system. Got to put my name in it. My wife says I cannot, I cannot develop another pattern unless I put my name on it. Yeah. So technically, if you're following the, um, the moving average pattern, the moving average pattern doesn't have a, a, a price limit on it. Whereas the buy at B, we have a price limit of twenty. As a general rule, we want to buy IPOs that are less than twenty dollars a share with that particular pattern. With the moving average pattern, and I kind of backed in this by accident, but I did not put any price restrictions on it simply because if something is truly taking off, then I want to get in with this pattern. The other pattern was a little bit different, and through a lot of empirical research, in other words, looking at a lot of charts, it seemed to work best with stocks that were less than $20 a share. Now, the caveat that I discussed in the IPO course was that this might just be an anomaly over the last several years, so always keep in mind these type of things. And I learned early on in my analysis or through learning markets that you got to be really careful about putting a hard and fast rule into something. So that $20 rule, that's a general rule, and that's subject to change over time. But for now, we're sticking with that. But with the with the IPO Dave Landry's five-day moving average IPO breakout pattern. We're not worried about price. And, and the beauty of this is like a longer-term IPO or something that's more of a toddler that's been established for a while, like Ferrari, for existence, for example, this pattern will make sure it gets you in. Now, is this a setup? Yes. If it closes anywhere above 26, it would actually be a buy today. So that'll be fun to watch. Let's take a look at Ferrari while we're at it. And here's my point that if you decide you want to buy an IPO, you could wait for this pattern to trigger what you did like right around here or something. Go back to prior webcasts of the weekend charts. You can find them on the video page where we talked about that. So that's the beauty of the pattern. If you get a longer term stock that goes turns into a winner even after abysmal initial performance, then it's worthwhile. And this is the pattern I call the die and the fly. They come public, they absolutely die, and then they fly. Okay, Some things just weren't quite right back here, and then they get their act together. The underwriter might have fudged up. Uh, a lot of people might have been dying to get off the hook, etc. And that's one of the problems with IPOs. That's why they often die. One of the reasons, of course. CAMT, I've never heard of it. Let's see what it is. Well, I should have heard of it. All right. Kind of a crazy, decent volume. Yeah, that's starting to look pretty good. Put that on your watch list. I should have that on my watch list. I don't. Well, after today's action, let's see. CMT. Nope. All right. Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Good eye on that, Donald. Good job. Don't make me drop the mic and walk out. <laughs> My mic's on a boom now, so I can't drop it. Yeah, uh, this one, John, is on my Landry list, so let's 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 um, let's pass on that one for now. SPWH. Yeah, this looks okay. Let's uh, pick it apart a little bit. Um. It's not bad, okay? You do have a little overhead supply around 8 bucks a share. I guess that would be a good problem to have. It's kind of bow tie-ish, pulling back. You just really have this one big bar up, but it's okay. It's not bad. You've got a nice cup pattern here. I would say okay. Uh, again, a lot of bad memories, though, so your gains would be capped. If this overhead supply was a little bit higher, I'd be more excited about it. But I, I hear you. I mean, a nice, I guess if it went to 8 bucks a share, you got in around 6 It's better than poking the eye. But it seems like your upside would be capped on that. You want to try to make as much as possible in every trade. You don't want to cap it. But it's not bad. You could certainly do worse. Yeah, this is an example of, this is a good example of like uh, Dave Landry's five-day IPO <laughs> trading system. So let's put a simple moving average in here. And you can see that, okay, what's the first rule? Well, if the high is set on day one, it has to close above that high. 
and not just a new closing high. So this will be a closing high here. You see the close right here? And this would be a new closing high, an all-time high, I should say, closing all-time high. Okay, and then it also has to break away from the moving average, which let me just see if it's on the moving average here. Probably touching it. Let's see. Low is 1676. Moving average is, yeah, so it went below the moving. So technically it wouldn't be a buy on that day, but it'd be a buy on this day here at, on the close at 1950. Okay. So yeah, good eye on that one. It's it's certainly so far so good. You're actually in profit taking mode on that one now. Good job, RJ. Kala for Miss Jill. It's a little squirrely, and one thing I'm noticing, the 50-day HV is 91. Not that I wouldn't trade a stock with an HV of 91, but once you see that HV approaching triple digits, you want to make sure that the stock has the ability to trade cleanly. And one thing I'm seeing, it kind of takes off, implodes, and now it's taken off again. I would only get excited about this one if it could clear this prior peak here decisively and then maybe look to play pullbacks along the way. Uh, just keep in mind, be you know, brace for a bumpy ride and make sure you use a nice wide stop on that. The beauty, and, and again, I've got so many videos on so much of this stuff, and if you go into my YouTube channel or that videos page I talked about earlier, you should be able to find it. If not, ask me, I'll help you. But one thing I talked about was that Trading volatile stocks isn't always more dangerous, believe it or not. It's better the devil you know. And if you look in the free reports on my website, I have a, a, a report on that called just that, I think, better the devil you know. So if you are trading a stock that has an HV of 91 and you have your stop outside of the normal noise, in other words, you've taken into consideration that volatility, then you're trading fewer and fewer shares. And it's actually not as dangerous as trading a less volatile stock because your stop is going to be much tighter, but then you'll be trading more shares. So you're actually putting more money at risk and something bad could always happen to a less volatile stock. And that's why I actually like trading less volatile stocks on the short side, waiting for that black swan, so to speak, type of event to occur. All right, let's take a look at Momo. All right, Howard, you're next. Yeah, Momo looks pretty good. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is notice that it based and did it pull back below this base. But it looks okay, okay? So, I mean, you can see it did have a nice, it's, it's based on the magnitude trend and then the pullback. It's okay. It's pretty good. I mean, I would stop short of a high five just because it had this base here to pull back below this base. But it's made such a big move longer term it still looks pretty good. So I would say I, I would say it's okay. If this pull if this breakout were well above this base and then this pullback didn't quite touch the base, okay, you can see it pull back below the base, then I'd give you a high five. But it's not it's not bad. It's definitely look at that right there. It's on my momentum list. I need to hide that list because I know how you people work. That happens before you, you guys are like go through that list one by one. <laughs> Get your own momentum list. Now, it's easy to make. You just see something that looks like this, banging out new highs and sticking it in the list, okay? I'm feeling generous. I'll give you that list. Just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll export it out, and I'll send it to you. How's that? Uh, yeah. Now, we do have that. that the problem with this one is a um, couple of things I don't like. Okay, technically, if it closed somewhere in here, it would be the buy at B pattern, which is in the IPO course which isn't on sale now, but if you ask me nicely, maybe I'll put it on sale for you. Um, so that's one caveat. The other thing that I'm seeing is that it's only got a range of about two points, uh, peak to trough, and based on an IPO, it should be some excitement in here, okay? So there's two types of patterns when it comes to IPOs, okay? There's the pioneer type of pattern where you're looking to get in first chance, okay, the first little pullback, or maybe the first, the buy a B, or even the, even the uh, early phases of the Dave Landry's five-day moving average. We need to come up with a new name for that, but it has to have my name in it, otherwise my wife will, will kick me out the house. 
And that's taking a page out of John Bollinger's book, who was uh, brilliant to put his name on something. <laughs> Anywho, um, I would, instead of trading a pioneer pattern in a stock like this, where the range is fairly small, and look, it's a trucking company, okay? Now, again, not to, not to soft sell the course, but as we discussed in the course, just because it's, it's fresh in my head, you have to ask yourself with an IPO, what's the story, fad, or glory? Okay, so is a trucking company going to split the atom? I don't know. Maybe they're the best trucking company in trucking company town. I don't know. And I'm not confusing the issue with fundamentals. I'm just saying there has to be some sort of story or fad or glory or something behind an IPO to really make it great. And a lot of times you don't have to figure that out, okay? All you have to do is just say, okay, well, what's the range on this thing? Well, the range is only a couple of points. Eh, it's about 10% range. That's really not that impressive in an IPO if you think about it, okay? I mean, we're long JNCE. Let's, let's see what that, that one's done, okay? I mean, let's take a look at the range on that. So, you know, it's like 64% here, and then... By the time it set, before it set up, it ran 30%, you know, a little bit higher price, a little bit bigger range, obviously, on that. But you don't want to rush in on them when they have a very small initial range. So put it on your list. But uh, Frack I like. It's actually, I, sh I didn't realize it, but it is in my lander list today. Uh, one problem with it, let's take a look at these all-service stocks. Let's Let's take a look at the... Let's jump to the sub-industry, okay? What are they doing? What are the all-service stocks doing? Okay, anyone? Look, I drew it for you. Anyone? Have you been paying attention? Okay. They're going down. What are they doing today? They're down 2.3% today alone. Just for S&Gs, let's throw some bow ties in there. Dave Landry's magical bow tie pattern. Eh, it's sort of a bow tie here, a little sloppy. But you get the idea. The moving averages have turned down. They're in downtrend proper order. Kind of choppy, kind of wide and loose, okay? So for me to buy an all-service stock, it's going to have to knock my socks off, okay? So let's take a look at the frack. Kind of interesting. This is a good example, by the way. This is a, a good example of Dave Landry's five-day moving average pattern. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Okay, so see, you never did, you never did have a trigger in this. You actually had to buy a buy a B trigger, but it was above, it was what above twenty dollars a share. So what do you do? Don't take it. Okay. So you can see simple little pattern. There's your daylight right there, but not an all time. I'm sorry, not a closing high. Okay. So what do you do? You leave it alone. Don't do anything. Right. And then it implodes. Now we want to look at it as a new setup. Sometimes IPOs go down, bottom out, and take off again. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. It's on my list for today. I'm watching this one. The only thing about it that I don't like is the fact that it's in all service. Okay. And it's a pretty good looking setup. It's a first thrust type of setup, a little bit of a pullback. In this particular case, now usually with first thrust and Transitional type of pattern such as Dave Landry's magical bow tie. I'm going to start throwing Landry in front of everything from now on, I guess. Make the wife happy. Is you, you can't sit around and wait for a deep pullback. But in this case, I'd like to make an exception and, and I almost feel a little bit better if it pulled back a little bit more. But yeah, that's a pretty good looking setup. Now, let's take a look at the bow ties. You can see looks like it's close to being a bow tie. Or, I'm sorry, Dave Landry's magical bow tie. That's a mouthful, huh? So, yeah, definitely okay on that one, okay? Jill, good eye. All right, let's see what we got here. Ketos. A little wide and loose longer term, as you can see. One problem that I had with this one recently is that it had this huge breakout and then it went into drift mode. But the good news is now it's beginning to accelerate higher again. 
So I'll know it. What's his name? Potter Smith. I'll know it when I see it. But let's see what happens. Maybe on a TKO. Go ahead and throw that in your momentum list. Okay. MRVL. That's going to be a semiconductor. Yeah, Joe, it's making new highs, putting you momentum list, but obviously it's not set up yet because we trade what? Pullbacks? But yeah, absolutely. Put that in your momentum list. It's making it all-time highs or close enough for government work. Probably 20-year highs. Nope, not quite all-time highs. Yeah, a lot of the semis made new highs in 2000, and I haven't seen them since. Okay. But yeah, if it keeps breaking out, maybe on a pullback. JLYC. JLYC. Yeah, it's kind of flying higher. Uh, let's take a look at this HV. This HV is jumping out of me. 175. That's ridiculous, okay? That's a little too crazy for me. Even for Big Dave standards, it's too crazy. So it went from, let's see, what's this down here? This is what I call a bottle rocket. It went from 3 to 16 over a short period of time. What's that, a bazillion percent gain? Let's see if we could measure that roughly. So it went up 300% over the last week or two. That's a little crazy. Um, I would leave it alone. Okay. A lot of times with these bottle rockets, the reason to call them a bottle rocket is, I don't know if you guys, I'm kind of a redneck, so I enjoy things like fireworks. <laughs> But a bottle rocket, it's a little uh, firework you put into uh, a bottle, hence the name bottle rocket. And, you know, you put it, as you're not very good at drawing, but let's say you got a little bottle rocket. And, you know, when you light them, it's like they go, like they're going to go to the moon, right? And they go, and then they just come right back down, obviously. So... I call those stocks bottle rockets, and you got to be really careful with the bottle rockets. All right, BRKS, that's going to be a semiconductor, I think. Looks okay. This, this one's been, I think I took this one off the Landry list yesterday, but it's been on my list for a while. It's still on my momentum list. Uh, it's okay. It's got a nice little kind of a TKO type of move, which took about a couple days to unfold. It's not bad, okay, but it's starting to lose a little steam in here. I'd say it's okay. I mean, you know, enter, enter here, and then I guess a stop down here. But you can certainly do a lot worse, so it's okay. I like to kind of see them, sometimes after these TKO type of moves, I like to see them trigger right away and just take off. But it's certainly okay. There's nothing wrong with it. I really can't pick it apart. Yeah, John, that one's on my momentum list, too, FNJN. Um, yeah, absolutely, but not it's not set up, okay? You got a nice, persistent move higher. It's on my it's on my watch list. Let me show you. There it is right there. Bam, winning. And I'll give you this list if you want. All right, everybody wants to know about shop. A couple of uh, Arsene and Donald. Let's take a look at shop. Yeah, shop, uh, I think that's been, see, it's down here in my minimalist, too. It's been on my watch list and the lander list for a while. That's a nice little TKO type of move. Um, it's a little frothy up here, but as a true trend follower, I guess I can't argue with it, okay? So it would be kind of almost textbook in nature with TKO type of deal. It's okay. I can't. I certainly can't fault you on that one. I mean, it's got everything I often preach about. Look at that acceleration and trend, persistency, TKO. So yeah, that's pretty good. GLYC. Yeah, we talked about that one. That's the bottle rocket. Goose. Yeah, we talked about that one already, didn't we? Or did we? So let's put the let's put uh, let's take a look at Dave Landry's moving average magical moving average what do I call it IPO moving average system. All right, we've got a. It would have been or would it have been? Let's just measure that. That's kind of interesting. 
what's the high on that? 1840, and it had to close above 18, uh, 1842. Okay, by Nat's eyelash, it would have been a buy on this day if you're doing the Dave Landry's IPO breakout moving average system thing. It looks okay. Um, I would let it make new highs and then play a pullback. Okay, but it does it does have that IPO breakout characteristic. Okay, John got long goose at 1723. I'm not sure what pattern you were trading. And you took partial profits. Good for you, John. MDXG. That's the other thing I was thinking about the, the learning management system. It's really going to be cool when I do something like IPOs. For instance, like the buy at B, I have a rule that it has to be, the price has to be below 20. So what I was thinking a couple days ago is like, boy, I could do some great examples in, in the quiz where I have like these awesome looking buy at B patterns, but the price will be in the 20s, like $25 or something. And just little things like that, that's the hard part a lot of times for people. And I think part of the problem is everybody wants to, everybody's excited to jump in the trade. Usually that's the, the biggest problem I see is people are overly excited to, to find setups and jump in on trades. Occasionally there are people who, who are um, afraid to trade, so to speak, and afraid to take anything. But for the most part, I think most people – trade in mediocrity and that's something I actually covered when I got the psychology and I talked about what Dr. J, a psychiatrist, was telling me about that because I because I couldn't understand. I was like, why do people who look for perfection in life and who are very successful, why do they trade in such mediocrity? And she explained to me that it's because they're forced to take whatever train wreck that comes along. And that's why they, they take such uh, mediocre stocks. So I think people are just anxious to take stocks and they're willing to overlook some, some flaws or some, or some rules that don't quite fit. And I think through the learning management system, I'm going to be able to flesh that out in quite some detail. In fact, that's going to save me, not that it's all about me, but that's going to save me a lot because I'd say, okay, go in and look at question three and there's your example of why we didn't take the trade. Oh, uh, this looks fantastic. Who picked this? Jim, good job. High five. Um, I prefer if it wasn't so wide and loose back here, but it did get past its prior highs. If I didn't see the whole chart, if I was just seeing this, by the way, if I didn't see the if I didn't see the left side of the chart, if you find a broker that lets you trade off the left side of the chart, please let me know. But yeah, that's a that I think that's worthy of a high five. A uh, little bit of a gap in here, and this is one that was actually on my list. It's still on my list. And I actually said if it didn't, uh, you know, one thing that I was a little concerned about was the gap in here. But it's not that big of a gap. And it did have a pretty good run. So, yeah, that looks pretty good. Marcy's five-day EMA. Yeah, there you go. Marcy's five-day EMA pair. Yeah, that'll work. MDXJ. MDXG. We just looked at that one. Uh, VLEV, the mother of all trend knockouts. V E E V. The mother of all trend knockouts. I don't see it. The mother of all trend knockouts. I don't see it. But it's certainly uh, looking pretty good in here. Put that on your momentum list for sure. CLDR. Uh, it's kind of all over the place, but I, this is one that I was looking at. It has good volume. And then if we take a look at Dave Landry's five-day IPO, incredible, awesome system, we would uh, have a buy here. Okay. But Dave, it didn't close at a new high. Yes, it did. It closed at a new closing high. Okay. It has to close at a new high if the highest set in the first day of trading for the first five days, which it was not. So that would have been the buy here. But, yeah, it still looks pretty good. Uh, if it could continue higher, then I'd look to play a pullback now with this one. 
But Dave, it's above 21. It's above 20. Well, in this particular case, we don't worry about price, okay? With this Dave Landry's five-day IPO magical system, we don't worry about price as much, okay, or at all. BYSI, thin but trending, BYSI. Yeah, so wait for the next, uh, see if it can continue higher, wait for the next pullback. Um, yeah, this is way too thin to trade. What's that? It's traded um, 5,000 shares. I hear you. It's making new highs. You know, maybe if uh, some volume flows in, not that we're using volume as a signal, but use volume as a, whether it's thick enough to trade. Osar? Osur? It's a little on the thin side, not incredibly thin. Um, my problem here is you got this one big breakout bar and nothing else. And then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. You got 19 days in the pullback. So I would pass based on those two things. If it bangs out new highs and then pulls back, then it might be worthwhile. 2-2, two, two, tea time, 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, on a pullback, it's uh, put that on your momentum list. Um, my only concern is a little stretched in here, a lot stretched. But let's see what happens on a setup. Maybe if it makes a textbook setup, textbook TKO, but you can't argue with the fact that it's doing what? It's accelerating higher, okay? You're not as thin but trending. You're, Y-E-R, Y-E-R, you're. Yeah, it's, that's kind of thin, too. I mean, it's a average volume, 28,000. You know, one one thing that te with technical analysis is you need a representative sample, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, you have to have enough people in there to get a sampling of all of the emotions or at least enough emotions to make technical analysis work. And when they're this thin... It could be a little tricky. You know, one huge trader could come in, and he doesn't even have to be that huge, okay? Somebody could do 1,000 shares, and that's what uh, most of the day's volume. <laughs> so you're not getting a true representative sample. That's a problem with technical analysis when it comes to very, very, very thin stocks. So I would I would leave that alone. Run, don't walk away from that. Sign up? Yeah, it looks pretty good. The only thing I'm, only thing that jumps out at me, your 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 breakout so far has just been this one huge bar higher, and not much sense. Okay, and you're also it's not bad, but I think I would pass on that. I you know unless this thing can just bang out some new highs and show that it has some some longer term follow through, I think I leave it alone. CLDR. Can we talk about that one? Yeah, we talked about that one, I think. UCTT. Yeah. Um, now, sometimes I could be, I'm not a perfectionist in life. I mean, look at my desk. It's an absolute mess. My wife, we're talking. My wife and I were having an interesting discussion last night about what a mess I am. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not necessarily looking for perfection everywhere. I'm not OCD or anything, but when it comes to markets, I, I like to look for a little bit more perfection. And in this particular case, I'd like to see maybe a little bit more knockout move, but uh, put it in your watch list. I know some of you guys are following along and have been in this one for a long time. And, I, and uh, thanks for the kind words on that. Mew is going to probably be a little too thick for me, unless it's the mother of all setups. Um, just the opposite extreme of some of those other stocks. What is this, 28 million shares on average volume or some ridiculous number? One, two, three. Yeah, 26 million. And then what do we have? We have a sideways range. If you're long, stay long. But for me to get excited, I have to break out and not look back for a while and then pull back. You know, we're long Kemet in the, in the semiconductors, for instance. And you can see 
a little bit thinner, obviously, 700,000 average shares. And it's obviously kind of in a nice trend, accelerated higher. In fact, it's even set up right now because notice it broke out. It didn't come back into the base. What was that one we were talking about earlier? It came back into the base. I forget the symbol, but if you rewind the tape, you'll see what we talked about that. But this looks kind of cool. I mean, this is what you want to see in a setup in the semis. And, and the overall semis, let's take a look at the SMH for SMGs. The overall semis look like this. Find something that's that's also in a trend but has set up. Okay, Don. So I, I'd leave the U alone. DDD, uh, just join. I apologize if I've already done. No, no, not yet. We have not talked about DDD. Yeah, same thing I said last week. You could say I got a drawn in here. Nice accelerated move higher, but it's going to need a bit of a knockout. So it's not set up. But if you want, put it on your momentum list. It has some bad memories way back here, but that's so far ago. Let's not worry about those too much. So, yeah, it's either going to have to do one or two things. One, accelerate higher, or two, have a knockout move like we, we drew last week, or I talked about last week, Phil. MGM. Well, the first thing jumps out at me is the net-net is the net net price change from uh, from here to here okay so for all of May it hasn't it's up a percent change which could easily go down in one day so you got one month of sideways movement so for me to get excited about this one it would have to accelerate higher and then pull back somewhere along the way I think the RNC's are doing okay let me just jump to the sub industry yeah you can see RNC's okay in fact, right at these brand new highs. But you might be able to find something. So here's the deal. Let's say you find an RNC you like, a resort and casino, that is. You could change your watch list to the sub-industry and then see if you like something even better, okay? Well, this is kind of losing momentum. Let's see. This is this is okay. That's kind of interesting. Looks like it's triggering now, taking off the new highs. But the uh, HV was kind of low on that. So what I like to do, once I find something I like, is go through the sector that's a little too thin, a lot too thin, and see if there's something exciting within the sector that looks even better, a sexy sister or a sexy, sexy brother, depending on your preference. I guess nowadays it doesn't matter, does it? It matters to me. <laughs> Sorry. I'm heterosexual. I'm proud of it. Not that there's anything wrong with being... Whatever. All right. Any uh, any other questions? No stock picks. Going once. Going twice. As soon as it goes shut down, somebody's gonna throw one in. I know it. Ah, I knew it. <laughs> Qui Kiwi. Q I W I. Yeah. Put it on your watch list. Um, Decent volume. It has some bad memories, but those are a eh, long ways away, fairly long ways away. Um, and then maybe if it can continue higher, for me to buy this stock, it would have to accelerate higher and then knock out. But so far, so good. You can see shorter term, it has moved higher nicely. <laughs> Don. <laughs> Is that for Don? <laughs> what's, what's the joke we used to say about Don? It's like the, the guy who goes to hunt bears and the bear has his way with him every week. <laughs> One day the bear taps him on the shoulder and is like, hey, you're not out here for the hunting, are you? Don, 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 are you a momentum trader? Look at that. Okay, just draw your big blue arrow. What would the this fat bastard say that? It's a piece of crap. <laughs> yeah, once again, Don's not here for the uh, hunting. Seriously, Don, come on. Why don't you use a 10-day EMA in a bow tie? Uh, because for the 10-day period, I like to see a true representation of price. And if you go watch, um, I'm going to soft sell you on something that's free. <laughs> go in and watch the first four videos, specifically the fourth video of the Trading Full Circle course, which you can get uh, right now if you go to the homepage on my, my website and click on the first video on the top. It's right there. You can, you can uh, sign up to watch them. 
with the bow ties, I use a 10 simple, a 20 exponential, and a 30 exponential. I like the 10 day simple because it gives me a true representation of the price. So it tells me what the price was over the last 10 days. Now for longer term moving averages, I like the, and, and if you watch the, just watch the video, because I'm not going to explain the whole video to you right now, but watch the video, it don't make a lot of sense, but a lot of sense, but longer term moving averages, when they're EMAs, exponential moving averages, they catch up the price quicker. And I don't want to explain the whole thing, but here I go. <laughs> And the beauty is when price crosses above, let me just redo this. When price crosses above an EMA and closes above an EMA, the EMA will eventually will, will immediately turn back up. Okay. But on a SMA, I like the longer term SMA to just uh, I'm sorry, I like the short term moving averages, 10 days or less, to be SMAs, okay? Just like the Dave Landry's IPO five day SMA breakout magical system uses a five day moving average. And one one anomaly or whatever you want to call it with the with the bow ties is by having that moving average being a simple moving average, the exponential moving averages make nice little um, reactions with it. Okay. And like a 50 day moving average, like a 50 day simple, which is kind of cool, sometimes your your bow ties will will intersect right at that 50 and you have a sharp angle of attack against that 50. So it gives you a good reference. So I guess that's one reason is like I like the way the shorter term moving averages react and especially when combined with the exponential moving averages, the 20 to 30. Now what's cool about this 50 is because it's a lot slower and takes a long time to catch up, you can have some pretty cool reactions against the 50 with the with the bow tie. So I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth, but for the bow tie itself, I like a 10-day simple because I like to see a true representation of price. And then I want the front rating waiting to occur with the longer term moving average. So watch the video when you get a chance. <laughs> yes, but so forward a while ago, just wanted to say hi. I was in a car accident in January. Sorry to hear that. Not my fault, but haven't been doing much trading. I'm long mewing out. To, uh, well, good for you, Don. Uh, not for the car accident, but good for you that you're not in Ford. But, yeah, hang in there, man. Hope you feel better. To those of you who don't know Don, Don comes and asks about Ford, and then we beat him up. But he, I think he likes the abuse. But you should. All right, let's take a look at uh, T and K. Let's take a look at that one. T and K. Uh, and the question is, is it worthy of a, of a Phoenix type of stock? Well, yes and no. Yes, because I hear you, and it's just was it, – it, some point way up way back in history is at eight dollars a share. What was it historically? Twenty one. Okay. But unfortunately, in a case like this, it's got a mountain of overhead supply here, and then it's kind of got all this trading here. So if it dipped below this level, it would have to clear all this. Okay. And then as it stands now, even if it began to set up, you'd be taking a setup right into a mountain of overhead supply. So the answer, the reason I'm saying yes and no is yes, it might be worth watching much, 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 much longer term. But everything I do is setup based. So if this sets up two years from now, then I'll see it. I'm not going to sit here and watch this stock every day. Like, ooh, what's TK, T and K doing? I'll just put it on a momentum list if it's something I want to keep an eye on. But something like this is just kind of bottoming out. This bottoming process might take three years. So, and then you know the stock the stock could go bankrupt in the process. Somebody was talking about Tidewater going bankrupt. Okay, here's a good example where you don't necessarily want to buy something because it's low. Tidewater was what 60 and a couple of years ago, and then now it's just down here grinding it out at these low low levels. Okay, you know maybe it might set up and might be worth a shot, but there's no reason to go after it just because it's at low levels, okay? And this might turn into a zero stock and not a Phoenix stock. We'll see, okay? We'll know when we see it. Yeah, Howard, that one's on the Landry list. Let's uh, not go there. But, yeah, good good job on that. Thanks for another great webinar. You're welcome, Joe. Show was great. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome, Don. Sorry I beat you up. <laughs> but it's so much fun. 
All right, I need to go ahead and wrap things up. I'm right at the cusp of uh, being uh, the end of things. But, uh, again, thank you guys. You're welcome, Marjorie. I appreciate you guys and girls showing up. I love doing these, and I'm just, again, I'm humbled that you guys come to see me. So thank you so much. Um, any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Landry, we don't talk to you now and then. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.